Well, 2023 was the hardest year of my life. Spiritually, emotionally, just it was a heavy year in my heart and in my soul. And over the last few years, it's become a tradition that I do a recap and I kind of do my seven life lessons from the year. So yeah, let's get into it. I don't know if you guys ever have this, if you ever have it where you just go into a year and you just know it's gonna be a difficult year. I finished up 2022, which was all things considered an amazing year for me. It was a very cool era of my life. And I guess I just knew coming off the back of such an amazing year, I was gonna be thrown a few tests and I was gonna need to adjust and I was gonna need to learn a lot of very important life lessons in 2023. And that is precisely what happened. So before we get into the first life lesson, I think I'm in a very unique position because a lot of the people that you watch on YouTube, I'm not saying that it's admirable. I'm not saying that you should, but they don't push life as much as I do. Once again, I'm not saying that my life is right or wrong or it's the best way that you should live life. And that'll even be some of the life lessons that I want to present to you guys today. But it's undoubtable that I try to push everything to 10 out of 10. Financially, at least for my age, the amount of money is like, you're not going to find many people at my age who make tens and tens of millions of dollars after tax who aren't athletes or rappers, entertainment actors, I guess. And then if you do find those people, usually all the other areas of their life are just like so out of whack. You know, they have shitty health. They don't take care of themselves. Whereas when it comes to my health, I, I do things all the time to just try to feel something to like challenge myself to like push myself outside of my comfort zone. I ended off this year running three marathons in three continents in one week with one of my companies. You know, we have so many employees that we split it up between LA, London and Cape Town. And, you know, the team traveled to wherever they wanted to run. And yeah, I ended up running in every single city. So I push my health, I push my body and I'm capable of so much from a physical perspective. Or for example, maybe someone makes a bunch of money, but they just they're very awkward and uncomfortable with girls and they don't really know how to attract women. And yeah, I guess we'll touch on that a little later down the line of where I stand sort of in that aspect of my life but you know when it comes to all areas of my life and even this year you know my relationship to god i push everything to as close to 10 out of 10 as i possibly can i guess hand on heart i really can't think of many slash any people who are out there that are pushing all these areas of life you know almost as a form of exploration to see what they like, what they don't like, what truly, I guess, constitutes a good life. And I feel like I'm so honest with you guys. You know, I'll touch on this a little later down the line, but I feel like so many people online just bullshit you guys and try to make their life look perfect. And I guess that's why I like these end of year sort of life lessons, because I get to tell you like the things that may seem the most glamorous, like let me pull back the curtain and let me tell you what it's actually like to live through. You know, some of your dreams, maybe you're on TikTok, maybe you're on YouTube and you have this dream life and it's like just because you see something and it looks like this fairy tale paradise. No, let me be the one to tell you what actually comes with it. And then maybe after you find out everything that comes with it, you know, maybe you still do want that life or maybe you don't. But I guess that decision is up to you. And that's why I feel a great sense of responsibility when I wrap up every year with these seven life lessons. So Let's get into the first one. The first life lesson for me in 2023 was if you don't set your expectations correctly, your biggest dream can turn into your worst nightmare. Now, from a young age, and I've had a very interesting life where I made my first million dollars at the age of 18 and every single year, my career and my finances, you know, I've always made more money than the year prior, whether that be as little as 20% more or there have been years where I've jumped up 500% in my income. And I always knew that that would never fulfill me or that would never give me, you know, that thing you want to like, ah, that I made it moment. Or even when it comes to, you know, everyone has their, maybe their dream body or their dream, like physical shape or, you know, where they know what they're capable of physically. I know some guys are just very like obsessed with their physiques. I, I was never into that. I've always been in incredible shape, always been super lean, always had a good frame and more importantly, a very functional body, you know, a body that can go straight from boxing to CrossFit training to running three marathons, like a functional body, as I said, but I knew that that like, you know, that's not going to fulfill you. You know, I never put down a pedestal or, or even when it comes to women and, you know, thank God, from a young age, I, I never put women on a pedestal. There's always one thing in my life that I did put on a pedestal. And that was buying my mom a house. And not just buying my mom a house, but buying my mom her dream house. And you know, this year I was very blessed and fortunate to do that. I bought my mom her dream house, $4 million in cash. And yeah, she got her 
dream home. Like I made that commitment to her a decade ago. Back then we used to talk about, you know, what, like, what does dream life look like? You know, what does your dream car look like? What is your, what does the dream everything look like? And, you know, I used to tell my mom as I was telling her about all my aspirations and my goals and my dreams and everything I wanted to do for us as a family, I promised her that I would get that house. I think that was the only thing in my life where like just 10 years of visions, 10 years of fantasizing, 10 years of like imagining what would that day look like where I could finally hand her the keys. And I did it. And you know what happened after? We probably had the worst three months of our relationship that we've ever had. So you know how it is, like single moms are always very intense and you know, they can just shout at you for no reason sometimes, but this was different. This was like really a rocky patch in our relationship. And you know, obviously you do a lot of reflecting and there's a few things that I have learned. I know that I've inspired so many people to retire their mom or their parents or whatever it is and buy them their dream house and really take care of them because they deserve the world. But I will also tell you, and this is not only my experience, this is talking to a lot of other people who have been fortunate to be in that position. I found this interesting thing where sometimes when you fix all of someone's problems and they have no problems left, you then become the problem. Because at least in my mom's case, and I said speaking to a lot of my other friends who have been privileged to retire their parents or retire their mom, they're so used to having problems in their life. They're so used to like, they're addicted to that feeling of having a problem and being stressed that when you remove that, it's not like that addiction goes away. That addiction is still there. It's just now when they legitimately have no problems, you become the target of their problems. And I think a lot of it had to do as well with some people just want to feel useful. Pretty much the first thing I did once I started making money was just, I told her, stop working. I'm supporting you. So it's been five or six years now. You know, my mom and I, you know, we both laughed and we said, listen, I think it's time for her to get a job or like, start a little side hustle or something because she is just so bored in retirement. So I guess there's two life lessons in that. First of all, I know that all of you guys are aspiring to retire your mom or retire your parents or whatever it may be. And just understand that depending on what your parents are like, parent or parents are like, you know, sometimes that can just be the beginning of the process. After that, you need to help them integrate into retired life or you need to like help them fill their time because some people, when you give them too much time, they just, it's not healthy for them. So that was the first lesson that I want you to take away from that. The second lesson I want you to take away from is never ever put something on a pedestal, never have expectations of what things are going to be like when you accomplish that goal or that dream. You know, this house thing was the first thing I ever put on a pedestal. And I'll be honest for a few months, I broke my spirit like to do this and then have the relationship turn so sour for a little bit of time and me scratch my head and wonder like why because listen at the end of the day in life you can never control someone's reaction like no part of you should feel worse for someone's reaction to something nice that you did for them like the main thing is you did something nice for someone because at the end of the day people are all going through their own shit. you know people have their own issues they have their own private battles they have their own things so you know, you should never ever let that sour your spirit. So really don't set any expectations. Have these big goals, these big dreams, these big aspirations, but don't think that you'll feel triumphant when you get there. You might, but you really don't know. Now, the second life lesson in 2023 is to push things to extreme and then pull it back. And this is just for me personally. You know, as I alluded to earlier, my life is just, it's so intense, it's so extreme. And I push things as far as you could really take them. Because for me, it's like a form of testing. Like I feel like life is this just beautiful game that we get to play. And for me personally, I wanna see all sides to it. And I wanna take things to 10 out of 10 as much as I can and take things to 10 out of 10 for the period of life that I'm in. You know, at the end of the day, I just turned 24. You know, obviously I grew up so quickly. I experienced so much of life early on, but for this season of my life, for this age, a lot of what I'm doing just makes sense and it's appropriate. With this year, I can't get that lyric out of my head um, that goes, at 17, I wanted everything that was in store. At 23, I bought it all just to make sure. Like that was, Pretty much this year, I have a quota which I need to meet, which is basically to spend 30% of my income. And this year, that was not possible. I tried, it just, within reason, it just it actually just wasn't possible. But it was interesting because it just gave me a lot of insight and, and bear in mind, this wasn't one of those years I increased my income by 500%. You know, this year was definitely a very healthy increase in terms of free cash flow, at least. I also did a lot of investing this year, like 
I invested a shit ton of money in companies, properties. This year was a, a heavy investing year, not to mention bonds, stocks, and I guess we'll, we'll touch on that just a little bit. But yeah, you know, I've experienced a very similar sort of lifestyle last year, year before that. I think it's like the past three years I've experienced, like once you get past eight figures a year and free cash flow, it's a different experience of life, I guess. But I can honestly tell you, I'm just spending just so much money. As I said, especially just because I, still invest so much money. Like I'm so financially responsible in terms of my investments and my savings and stuff like that. I just feel so not guilty, even though I know for some people they look at that and they're like, how do you spend so much money a month? But for me, I feel like an obligation because I have my savings, I have my investments. I've had my philanthropy, which I've always stuck with, which is 10% of my earnings, you know, a very small fraction of which I make public, 80 to 90% of which I have never made public. And I feel like that is sort of true philanthropy. I also just fucking hate that word, like philanthropy. It's just, I don't even wanna use that word, philanthropy. Sharing some of the blessings that you've been able to receive. But anyways, all that to say that, you know, I take all the dividends that I pull out and my free cash flow from all of my companies. You know, a lot of companies I have with business partners or I have equity stake in and I don't get to take out my profits just because, you know, I invest in the companies. I don't have majority stakes. So, you know, I don't call the shots on when we pull out the dividends. So, but anyways, all that to say that from the free cash flow, 10% goes to some of the charitable work. And then after that, as I said, I try my best to spend 30% of the income after that. I haven't been able to, but just the percentage I have, I guess it's just, I don't feel bad about it because I've been able to experience so much of life and like so much of what works and what doesn't work and what's worth the money and what's not worth the money. And I can tell you all the drawbacks that come with it. Once again, this is my issue with a lot of the people online that try to make their life seem fucking perfect or don't paint a accurate depiction of what their life is like at different stages and the pros and the cons because there's no such thing as a perfect life. And I can tell you right now that my life compared to three years ago is substantially worse from a quality of life perspective. Now it's a life that I have chosen for this season of my life and this era that I'm in, you know, and I was chatting with an associate the other month when I was in LA and he said something to me and I never thought about it that way. You know, he explained the difference between being a king and a prince. And he's like, being a prince is the best. Like you have moderately few responsibilities. You still make, you know, very good money. People know of you, but people don't like know, know you, you know, you're not really under a lot of scrutiny. And whereas when you go to a position of a king and listen, I'm not trying to be egotistical here, but King for me really means responsibility. At the end of the day, the companies that I fully own or have majority shareholding in, I employ hundreds of people. Like that's fucking insane at 24. That level of responsibility, and it's a massive responsibility. And I know a lot of people would buckle under that responsibility and sort of that amount of attention and eyeballs and you know, people looking to you for answers and guidance. So, you know, I've definitely pushed things to the extreme in my life on those fronts. And I can tell you that my life was definitely better just from a quality of life perspective. When, you know, a few years ago, four years ago, I was making a few million dollars a year. I had six to eight employees. People knew of me in my industry, but like I wasn't, I didn't have a big social media. I didn't have a big following. Like, yeah, I was just kind of doing my thing minding my own business. So I guess all that to say that it has been my observation that more responsibility correlates to a worse life for what people think they want in life. People want peace. They want to enjoy the moment. They want presence. And it's very hard to be present or at peace when you know that there's so many things like you don't, I don't ever get to switch off. I'll be honest. The only time I ever switch off is when I'm praying. Like apart from that, I don't get time to switch off. Like there's no moment I'm looking out of the window and I've explained this to people. It's like, listen, it doesn't matter if I'm in a private jet or I'm in the back of my Rolls Royce. I can tell you right now, I've had so many better times looking out of the window, sitting in economy class on British Airways, making making 15 grand a month, 20 grand a month, and just looking out and being like, wow, the sunset is so beautiful today. Or just being in an Uber and looking out the window and just thinking, wow, like, you know, what a great day is it? Or what do I want to do? I have free time. Or like, I've got, you know, my work is done for the day. You know, I can chill now. Like, that's a better quality of life. And it's not the life that I think I'm destined for because from a young age, I've just never been able to sit still. And from a young age, that stuff didn't appeal to me, but that's personal to me. And I can tell you that my life is constructed in a way that makes sense to me. And I think, you know, I'll say that to the end. 
because that was one of my other talking points. But yeah, I always have a big issue with, you know, a lot of these role models or influencers who try to make life look perfect, but then won't talk about the specifics of the life, which is what I have always tried to do. I've always tried to show you my life and then be honest of like, this is what it's like in reality. So the next learning lesson in 2023 is I think I'm ready to get married in my 20s, which scares the shit out of me. Now, when in my 20s, I don't know, that's a different story. But the reason it scares the shit out of me, I, I guess all comes down to upbringing. And I don't think you can use use that as an excuse for everything, but it plays a very big role. At the end of the day, like growing up, I, I had never seen a healthy relationship. I'd never seen a healthy marriage. I, I, I didn't know what love between two people look like, like between a, a husband and a wife, like even all the way down to, as I mentioned, my mom, you know, bless her. She's Eastern European slash Middle Eastern. We're in a funny part of the world. You know, even from a young age, we always had very sort of adult conversations about the world. You know, she always used to tell me that when you're with a certain caliber of man, as a woman, you just understand and expect that he's probably cheating or, you know, a few times a year, he's going out and doing his thing. And, and once again, the world is such a large place. I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not, I don't have no judgments about it. If you ask people from different parts of the world, they're all going to have different reactions to it. I'm just saying that for me, that's not the life I wanted, I guess. Imagine this at the age of 14, 15, I literally said, I will get married in my late 30s. You know, my plan was always to get married at 38. That's the number I had in my head because I knew for a fact I had so much and I wouldn't say misguidance, but like, I just didn't know what a healthy relationship was. Like, I didn't know what love was. And I knew that I would have so much work to do over the years. And, you know, I will say, even when I was younger, I had a lot of good, beautiful, healthy relationships. I, you know, I remember even when I was 16, I gave my girlfriend at the time, you know, same age as me, uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, five love languages, way of superior men. Like I gave her these books about relationships and like, how we could interact with each other and understand each other and understand the polarity that we had. So, you know, I did a lot of work when I was younger, but still nonetheless, from a young age, I said that I would get married later on in life because I knew that when I get married, I want to do this thing properly. Like I don't fucking want multiple wives. I don't want multiple girlfriends. I don't understand how you've got these role models who are so aggressively pushing traditional values. We need traditional values, traditional values. And then three sentences later, they're trying to justify why they have multiple baby mamas and why they've perpetuated a cycle of kids growing up in single parent households. I don't understand how that's a role model. Like, I don't understand how that's cool. I see a lot of these dudes actually like in their mid thirties, late thirties, even forties, and they're trying to make it seem cool, like have multiple girlfriends and have multiple wives and shit like that. Like, I don't know. I just think maybe when you're younger, like if you want to have multiple girlfriends when you're younger and you're honest with all the women, like, you know, fuck it. Who am I to judge? I'm very open and honest with the fact that like, I'm definitely not in a place to have like a traditional monogamous relationship right now, but at least any woman that I'm with, I'm always honest with them that I'm not in a place for monogamy. You know, there's so much work that I've had to do and so much work that I'll need to continue to do. But I don't know, for me in your late thirties, like why the fuck do you want to perpetuate such a sickening cycle of kids growing up without a dad in the home? I don't know. For me, I don't understand it. For example, Dan Bilzerian, he gets a lot of hate. I actually respect guys like that more because Dan Bilzerian, you know, he doesn't try to promote his lifestyle or say that it's a virtuous lifestyle or he doesn't make himself out to be like this morally perfect person. And, and you know, I actually really respect people that just live their life and are very open and honest and are honest about their bad sides, their good sides. And, you know, they're just not contradicting themselves all the time. And as I said, I guess I've just seen so many of these like red pill dudes and they just like, None of this shit makes sense to me, to be honest. I just don't get it. Anyways, all of that to say that my plan from a young age was always to get married at, you know, in my late thirties. And you know, the reason I wanted to get married in my late thirties was because I wanted to do it right. Like I wanted to be one wife who is the mother of my children. There is no other mother of my children. This is the mother of my children. These are my kids. And the reason I wanted to do it in my late thirties is because I didn't want to ever lie to my wife or pretend I could be monogamous when I couldn't. And it's so funny, you know, I even said that on a podcast and it like twisted it. And this is also a few years ago where I could be a little bit more brash. The bit that they cut up was, uh, if I get married now, I will definitely cheat on my wife. And they forgot to add the bit where it's like, I want to get married in my late thirties because I don't want to lie to my wife. I don't want to hide things from my wife. And I know that if I get married right now, I will cheat. And they forgot to add the end bit, which is, I don't want to do that, which is why, you know, for right now, I just could not get married. And yeah, that has always, even up until two years ago, been my game plan, which is get married in my late thirties to make sure that I do it right. But 
I guess on the theme of pushing everything to 10 out of 10, like I try to keep my relationship, dating life, like just that personal aspect of my life private. I just feel like religion and your relationship slash dating stuff, slash marriage, slash whatever it is that you have. Like those are just two things like the world doesn't need to know about. Like that's between you and a person, or for example, when it comes to religion, like that's between you and God. Like you don't need to make like this big song and dance about it. That's just me personally. You know, I don't really talk about some of the women's stuff, but it's just in the last like two, three years, it just gone so crazy. I don't know how to describe it, but I guess you just get to a point where you have pushed the women's stuff to like a 10 out of 10 where, you know, you've just got every guy's dream girls that are sliding into your DMs. And I'm telling you every single guy watching this, if you keep working on yourself and if this is a life that you wish to pursue, because maybe for some of you guys, you just want to get married at 18 to your childhood sweetheart. So for those that kind of have enjoyed a little bit more of that playboy lifestyle at any point, if you keep working on yourself as a man, you'll experience some of this stuff. But yeah, as I said, especially, I guess, like the last two years, it's just gone so ridiculous. Like it's stuff out of a movie, honestly. And I guess just traveling the world so much and just having like all of these women throw themselves like wherever they are, like wherever you are, whether that be online or in person, or you just realize that so much of it is all the same. I guess you meet so many women that it really helps you understand what a good woman is. You get to a point where you're just so tired of it. You just want to focus on good women and eventually, you know, that good woman for the rest of your life. So yeah, I guess all that to say that like, this is a weird time in my life where this is the first time in my life where I'm like, fuck, I'm ready to get married. I once again, I don't know when that is, but I couldn't imagine ever saying that before. And I can never imagine that saying that ever in my 20s. Like the plan was always, even up until two years ago, the plan was 38 on the dot. But yeah, the idea of just like enjoying that playboy lifestyle, it just doesn't really appeal to me anymore. It just seems so superfluous compared to building a family. And even though I had that timeline for when I would start building a family, I'm just like, why? Why, why keep doing this for, for so long when I experienced it it was like cool to experience i guess so all that to say that i'm very excited to lower the statistic of single parent households you know i also know that i still have a long way to go until you know i can commit to full monogamy but yeah i guess i'm committed to becoming that person and walking that path i know that i had maybe a little bit of a later start in life just because some of the conditioning that i had growing up but yeah i'm ready to give them all. The next life lesson from this year is the further you get in life, the more the defense is important. You know, I'm so much more risk averse these days. I think maybe a large part of it is knowing that I'm going to have a family soon, you know, kind of just feeling that in my heart and in my soul, you know, and maybe a part of it is just growing up and realizing that like you're not untouchable and or you're not invincible. And I think a lot of us when we're young, like we really feel that. And, you know, and I can definitely tell you that God reminded me of that this year. I mean, earlier this year, I nearly died. Like truly, I should not be alive. Like it's a miracle that I'm alive. And I really think that was God's reminder at the beginning of the year. Like it's time to grow up. It's time to realize that you're not invincible. You're not untouchable. Yeah, and I really took heed of that lesson and it's bled through into all areas of my life since. You know, I'm a lot more calculated. I think about defense a lot more. I said really in all areas of my life, even when it comes to like things like investments. You know, I remember there was a period a few months ago where I was buying millions of dollars a week in bonds, like literally the most boring safe investment you could possibly put your money into. You know, if you told me two years ago or three years ago that I was buying and buying in so much bulk government and double A corporate bonds, I, I would have laughed. Like two, three years ago, I was reckless. High risk, high reward. You know, sometimes in a single week or a single month, I would make millions of dollars. Sometimes I'd lose millions of dollars. I, I, I didn't give a shit. I didn't feel anything. You know, to me, and I think sometimes that's the very dangerous thing about like this whole internet stuff. I made so much money so early on in my life and it's always continue to carry on. Like you just become so desensitized to it. So for me, it was like, it was always just like funny money. Like, yeah, I think this year I definitely just matured a lot and you know, I've come to realize in life, it's just as much about defense as it is offense. Now, obviously, when you're earlier on in building your empire, you want to play more offensively. You know, you want to take more risks, but the bigger and bigger your empire gets, the more and more risk averse you need to be and the more you need to think about defense because, you know, one small move and your entire empire could get wiped out. Speaking on empire, that parlays into the next life lesson, which is when you build an empire, people will skim. Now, I don't give a shit what anyone says of like, oh, just have great people around you and, you know, you'll never get taken advantage of. It's like, that's bullshit. That was correct, for example, for me. You know, that was true 
four or five years ago when I had a lean operation. I was making a few million dollars a year. Take home, you know, my personal finances and investments and all these things weren't super complicated. And I could really have an eye on every aspect of the operations. Now it's a totally, totally different ballgame. And of course, you have people in place to manage this stuff. And of course, you have good people in your corner who are there to protect you and protect your interests. But at the end of the day, there'll be a couple percent here, one percent there, three percent there. And it starts to add up, you know, and I definitely started to experience it probably two, three years ago. But this year, like, yeah, it really hit me. You know, at this point, I have so many businesses, so many equity stakes in companies, so many investments, so many properties that it's just too hard to personally check off on every single invoice from a manufacturer from a service provider, from a payment merchant, etc. Or like even when it comes down to my properties, the surveyors, the plumbers, the engineers, like you know, there's just so many things that there's so many moving parts. And of course you have good people in your corner. You have a good CFO, you have a good family office, you have good property managers, you have good lawyers, you have good in-house accountants. You build this infrastructure around your empire. But at the end of the day, like there's always gonna be people who are trying to skim. And I think the way you need to think about it is in your life, think about how many ways people could fuck you, fuck you over, skim, take, you know, skim off, even if it's two or 3%, but they're skimming, they're taking stuff that isn't theirs, or they're overcharging, or they're slightly gaming the system. For you, maybe there's only like two or three avenues that could happen. When you start to build a big empire, there's thousands, tens of thousands of avenues that can happen. And maybe your team stops it 95% of the time or 98% of the time or 99% of the time. But when you go back and you backdate stuff, you just realize how much money that's been taken. And I guess I've just learned that skimming comes with the territory, like when you're building a big empire. And the only thing you can do is act swiftly and firmly when you spot it and when it gets brought to your attention. And most importantly, make sure no one in your inner circle is skimming. That's where it really gets dangerous and that's where our empire starts to collapse. So your inner circle needs to be bulletproof, which I've been very lucky to have. But you know, I've always been an introvert. I've always kept my circle quite small. I'm sure you guys have noticed, like I don't really network with too many people. I don't do too many collabs. You don't see me at like the big public events and stuff like that. And 2023, I was a little bit more like open to it. I kind of like interacted with more people. And yeah, I just like, it's not for me. I like to keep my circle small. I like to keep my circle tight. I like to just kind of be with my day ones or the people that have really like been through thick and thin with. So yeah. Now the next life lesson I had was I really had to realize like this is it. Like I will never get this era back. I will never get the snapshot of my life back. And you can ask absolutely anyone who's really like made it in life or achieved a lot. They always miss the old times, you know, the good old times, like they miss that era in life. And I think what I'm living through right now is what I will be thinking of in 10 years or 20 years where I'm like, oh, I miss the good old times or I miss that era. So I think one thing I really had to remind myself every single day waking up this year is like good, bad, incredible, horrific. It doesn't matter what I'm going through. This is an era and I will never get this era back. I will never get the snapshot of my life back. I would say the same thing to you, which is it doesn't matter how shit your life is right now. Like it doesn't matter how down in the fucking dumps you are. Embrace it because you're never going to get this back. Like if you go on the trajectory that I know all of you guys will go on because you're watching content like this, you're following my stuff. You can look back on my YouTube and watch me over the space of how long has it been now? eight years, nine years almost on YouTube, like documenting every single thing, all of my wins and my losses. Like, listen, you know, maybe it won't take three months to get to your goals or maybe it won't take a year. Heck, you know, maybe it might take two or three years or five years. Who knows? However long it takes. The thing that I implore you guys to do, my request from you is whatever you're going through, embrace it, like live it and feel it. It just comes back to me now. So many emotions and feelings from the come up, the point in which I decided I had this dream for my life and I was working year after year to make it a reality. And I love the fact that like, I remember those emotions so deeply. And I always have to remind myself that even now that I've accomplished a lot of this stuff, like experience it, like if it's good, experience it. If it's bad, experience it because you're going to want to sit with those memories 10 years from now, and you're going to want to relive these things. You never want a year that you look back at. And it does, as I said, it doesn't matter if it was good, bad. It, that does not matter. The point is you never want to look back at a year and be like, oh, I actually don't even remember what happened or like it was just a blur or it was just empty. So yeah, all that to say that whatever you're going through, like this is an era of your life. Embrace it, live through it.
make the most of it. And the last life lesson, and I always knew this, but this really hit home, is that my life should not be your life and your life should not be my life. I know I kind of touched on this earlier and I tried to stop myself, but I guess this is my issue with a lot of the content out there is they try to like show you just the good without the bad. And I have always tried my best. Maybe I could be better, but I've always tried my best to be very open and honest of each phase of my life and the pros and the cons and what you can expect if you want that for your life. And I think definitely this year, I'm, you know, I've become even more convinced that my life is so not suited for most people because the stress, the responsibility, these things I thrive on. Like for me personally, I love it. I enjoy it. But I honestly know that for 99% of other people, like it would just be too much for them. Like it wouldn't be enjoyable. It wouldn't be an enjoyable experience. They would be living through my life and just going like, why? Like you don't, you don't need to do this. Why are you doing this? Whereas on the flip side, I'll be honest, I see people living like a laptop lifestyle and I know that's a good life. Like I talk about it all the time, location freedom, financial freedom, and time freedom. If you have those three things, you're making 50K a year, 100K a year, your expenses are low. You're living an incredible life, but like I could just never do that. Like the idea of like working two hours a day or three hours a day, like that sounds like my worst nightmare. Like I hate vacations. Like it's the, the idea of like hanging out at the beach stresses me out. Like it just, it's, there's nothing appealing to me. Like I honestly find running three marathons in three continents in one week. For me, I find that more relaxing or enjoyable than like taking a one week vacation and just like sitting on the beach, like relaxing. Like for me, if I'm sitting on the beach, I have to like read a book or I'm on my phone, like on WhatsApp and yeah, I'll go in the beach and you know, I'll, I'll watch the sunset or some shit, but like, that's what I enjoy doing. So all that to say that never ever envy another person's life. I never ever want you guys to envy my life. You know, I think you guys should envy my character because you can see my character development year after year. At this point, as I said, it's crazy. Now I'll be nine years on YouTube or eight years, nine years on YouTube. And I think that's admirable, but definitely don't look at my life and think like, oh yeah, my life would be perfect in that scenario. Trust me, if you were in my position, you would beg for your life back, but that's fine. I'm not saying this as like a pity party thing. It's because my life is authentic to me. So find a life that is authentic to you. Maybe your authentic life, like your perfect life is my worst nightmare, which is, I know this sounds crazy to some people, but like, the idea of working two hours a day. For me, even if you made like 500 grand a year or like even a million dollars a year and you work like two hours and like chilled all day, like that's like, I, I just wouldn't enjoy that. I've, I've tried to in the past, you know, even like four or five years ago when I started getting into the territory of really good money, I, I tried that stuff, it wasn't for me. So find the life that's authentic to you. Every single year of my life, I will live life. And I'm telling you right now, Four years from now, my end of year seven life lessons may be totally different because I'll be in a totally different phase of life. But my goal here is the same goal I had when I was 16 uploading on YouTube. No one was watching. 20 people watched my videos each upload, but I didn't give a shit. I was just living life and I was sharing my experience and I was trying to tell people the highs, the lows, and just try to give people a real view of reality. I guess that is my promise to you for 2024. I will keep living life I will keep experiencing things and I am here to relay it to you. I'm here to tell you what works, what doesn't work. And when I tell you these things, you can do with that information as you please. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, those were my seven life lessons for 2023. On that note, let's look forward to 2024. 2024, I just feel is gonna be an incredible year. I don't know why. Weirdly enough, even going into 2023, I felt like 2024 would be an incredible year. So I, I just have a gut instinct sometimes. I appreciate those that stayed to the end of these ramblings. And as always, I'm watching from afar and I'm rooting for you.